Welcome to Coffee with Catholic Workers, a podcast made by and for Catholic workers. I'm Theo. And I'm Lydia. We've both been a part of the Catholic Worker for the last decade and are excited to bring to you conversations with Catholic workers from all over the world. Uh, This is our second of a three-part series focused on labor. Uh, Today, we have with us Lincoln Rice talking about Peter Morin's views on labor and how they were at times different from Dorothy's approach. Lincoln recently published The Forgotten Radical, Peter Morin, Easy Essays from the Catholic Worker, uh, that contained 74 essays that had previously been unpublished. Uh, Lincoln also has written about the Catholic Worker Arthur Falls uh, in his book Healing the Racial Divide. Lincoln is a longtime Catholic worker at Casa Maria, which is located in Milwaukee. Uh, So we're excited for Lincoln to be joining us today. Uh, Well, today we have with us Lincoln from Milwaukee. Lincoln, do you maybe want to give us a a quick introduction of yourself, of sort of who you are and what you're doing up in Milwaukee? (laughs) Sure. So, yeah, my name is Lincoln Rice. I've been uh, part of the Milwaukee Catholic Worker Casa Maria since 1998, and uh, during that time have also... Uh, at some point, went and got my PhD in Marquette at moral the- in uh, moral theology, and have published a couple books. And one of them, probably part of the reason for this episode, is in uh, summer of 2020, I had a book published called "The Forgotten Radical: Peter Morin," which is the first book to bring together all of Peter's easy essays that were published in the New York Worker, and then also about an additional 76 easy essays that were never published. And um, probably one of the things I'm more proud of in in the book that makes, gives it kind of more of my stamp is there's around 250 uh, biographical glossary uh, entries in the back where any person that Peter Morin mentions there's a little paragraph explaining like who they are, why does Peter Morin care, <laughs> stuff like that. So it's a lot of his figures. Some of them are more historical, but some of them are from his time period. And most of us are not well versed in the 1930s political American uh, American thought, except knowing that it was during the Great Depression. And for those who maybe have found the Catholic worker because of an interest in Dorothy Day, um, sometimes people aren't as familiar with Peter Morin. Could you give us a a short summary of of who Peter was and why he was so important to the movement? Yes, a good point. Yeah, so Peter, Dorothy would refer to Peter as the founder of the Catholic worker movement, though obviously they are co-founders together. And he was originally born in France, uh, would refer to himself as a French peasant who grew up in a a small village. And uh, we're not exactly sure, we're not positive why, but it appears partially because of the military draft uh, in the early 20th century, uh, left France to go to Canada, made his way to the United States and uh, was very well versed in Catholic history and thought, especially social Catholic history and social Catholic thought, and uh, started to focus more on that in the mid-1920s. And in 1932, someone said, you should check out Dorothy Day. They met in December, and a few months later, the first issue of the Catholic Worker newspaper was printed. And so many of the ideas of the Catholic worker movement, uh, such as the houses of hospitality, the farming communes, uh, voluntary poverty, uh, the list goes on and on. These are ideas that originated in Peter's thought and in his essays. Peter was a thinker with huge, uh, looking in, in all kinds of places, right? He had a, a vision for like a complete transformation of society. So it's hard to talk get, talk about like every aspect of that, but I I was wondering about getting like a little bit of an intro into 
what did he see as like the new society in the shell of the old kind of? Sure. And I think it's uh, when we give the very short version of how the Catholic worker came to be, it's like, oh, the newspaper started and they started houses of hospitality. But, you know, there is a gap there where the newspaper, the first issue of the newspaper comes out in May of 1933. And the first house of hospitality isn't started by Dorothy until December of 1933. And in the interim, Peter and the newspaper at large are really laying out what are society's ills and where we need to go. And Peter is already promoting what he calls his three-point program for society, which he'll term the Irish Revolution (laughs) or the Green Revolution, uh, patterned after how he viewed the Irish in cultivating culture in Europe in the early Middle Ages. But uh, the this three-point program of his of roundtable discussions, houses of hospitality, and farming communes, uh, early on, right after the newspaper starts, they have uh, the first part, the, um, the roundtable discussions. But he's really hoping that the houses of hospitality will be started by the U.S. bishops. And even, I, I believe, like, That year, the U.S. bishops had a meeting either in October, November, and so the newspaper that would have been published right before their meeting, he really is trying to make the point (laughs) extra clear that he wants them to start this. This is the Great Depression, and they could be a leading, uh, leading a new movement and showing the importance of Catholic thought in action. Uh, But nothing really happens on the bishops' end. Uh, they don't start any houses of hospitality, and, and it really is as winter, a very cold winter sets in in New York, and uh, people are literally dying on the streets that Dorothy starts the first house of hospitality. And so there, Peter's vision always is broader, but after the Catholic Worker Movement, named after the Catholic Worker Newspaper, uh, starts these houses of hospitality, he also begins emphasizing what the Catholic worker is. So there's kind of this uh, move where he's on two tracks of his vision for the world and vision for the Catholic worker, where initially it was really just more his vision for the world. Uh, and, and maybe I'll just add one more piece to that, that uh, he he does state that his foundation for building what he calls a functional society is voluntary poverty and the works of mercy. And so he sees these going together. I know that there are, even within our movement, there's maybe beginning to be a distaste for the term voluntary poverty and maybe a move towards something like simplicity. Uh, But for for Peter, I think no matter what word we're using, he'd wanna say that people won't be sharing enough of their goods with each other unless they're willing to live much more simply. So for him, just saying the works of mercy is the foundation for a functional society isn't enough unless he's also emphasizing that we need to be willing to share on a radical level. And I think that's why he also emphasizes the radical uh, voluntary poverty. So we've been looking at this theme of labor and looking at labor with Dorothy, labor currently. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about Peter's view of labor and work, um, if there's any difference between those things? Yeah, so, hmm. I mean, there definitely is a difference between Peter and Dorothy when it comes to views I don't know. I should, <laughs> there's a difference, perhaps, in practical application. I think, to some extent, their what I'd call their end game views of what labor and work should look like are similar. Uh, but Dorothy is definitely known throughout her life as supportive of the labor movement in the United States and supporting workers who are striking. And Peter is very famous and quoted very often for saying, "Strikes don't strike me." And for Peter, he often, he liked this use of puns and uh, maybe as, you know, English was probably his third language. 
because uh, he had his native language where he grew up and then he knew French and then and then he knew English and don't know if maybe he would have known Latin also because he never took uh, permanent vows but he was part of a brother a group of brothers a Christian brother teaching order so but for sure he knew three languages and perhaps the puns I mean some of them found sound wonderful in English <laughs> so, uh, even to the native speaker but some I think maybe seem more funny to him but the strikes don't strike me um, definitely got to the heart of his view of not worrying so much about the middle game. So if you want to call this vision of workers are the owner of the means of production, that you know, that our way of working in society is more that we're worker owners as opposed to worker employees. I think that's both the vision of Peter and Dorothy, uh, but Dorothy, I'd say knowing that there were so many people who were employees who were in vulnerable situations definitely spends much more of her time focusing on supporting laborers who are employees where Peter spends more time painting his vision of um, laborers who own their own means of production, um, work for themselves, He's also hoping that it's more creative labor. Uh, he viewed, uh, he liked to quote Gandhi uh, in saying industrialism is evil. So this view of mechanized labor where someone is doing just the same action over and over and over again, he viewed as uh, against the dignity of the human person though. I don't, those are kind of more I don't know, Catholic catchphrases that we use today. I don't, we wouldn't necessarily be using those types of terms, but I think that gets at the heart of what he meant. So there is this notion of, yeah, creative labor, ownership, and ag against industrialism that definitely dominates his thought on what work and labor should be. Did you happen to bring any easy essays with you about <laughs> Peter's uh, thoughts on labor? I did. <laughs> um, let's see which. So here's I had just quoted this one. Uh, this is essay 155. If uh, if anyone wants to find it in the book of essays, but it's called Mechanized Labor, and it starts off with his quote of Gandhi. Gandhi says, industrialism is evil. Industrialism is evil because it brings idleness, both to the capitalist class and the working class. Idleness does no good, both to the capitalist class and the working class. Creative labor is what keeps people out of mischief. Creative labor is craft labor. Mechanized labor is not creative labor. I think there's a sense where we definitely see today with mechanized labor, there's not only the uncreative angle of it, but I think Peter is, he doesn't always say this explicitly, but in talking about idleness, I think he views that there could be a day where mechanized labor leads to more idleness among people, even workers who may not have to work as much and this is where you know we've seen discussions of should there be a universal a universal basic income uh, because there might be a point where so many things are mechanized that it'll lead to unemployment and he definitely does express that that mechanization does lead to unemployment i think the <clears throat> standard capitalist answer is that It'll always, there'll always be new inventions that require people to think and work and do certain things. But I think Peter's suspicious of this. And there's a lot of technocrats even now who believe we're going to be, you know, as we become more mechanized and as robots play a greater role in society, that uh, we might be seeing greater unemployment on a global level. So P Peter's definitely I th hinting at that in this essay and is more explicit about it in other essays. And like <clears throat> for him that 
that idleness is touches on a lot of different pieces of his thought, I feel like, because for the rich, for like the capitalist owning class, that idleness is living off the sweat of another person's brow, which is a phrase of his, right? Um, and But for like the proletariat, for, for pe- the workers who don't own anything, that idleness is, is like a curse. They cannot earn a living for their family or anything like that. And and that idleness, he also kind of argues, is what leads to like depressions even and stuff like that, right? In one sense, leisure can be a good thing. I mean, many Catholic, depending on, again, how we define work, you could say many Catholic workers don't work, <laughs> but it's just not paid work. And doing something that, you know, one finds meaning in that's meaningful that's either contributing to society or helping people out or often I even hate using that word contributing to society because I feel like it's so (laughs) it's often used to talk about like we need to make sure that this person can contribute to society and pay taxes and insert themselves into you know everything that all Americans should dream about Uh, but but I think and what it means at the most basic level that someone's not contributing um, and helping build a better society that I think, yeah, can lead to depression and um, just sitting at home playing video games all day long, I don't think leads to a healthy life. I did also bring a, a, a second essay. Let me, oh yeah, so this one, this this one, was a meme for a while <laughs> uh, on the Catholic Worker Facebook page, but uh, on firing, this one's called Firing the Boss. So I, I know on, a, on one of the Catholic Worker Facebook pages when there was, uh, when people were quoting Peter on this, there were others, I'm assuming less familiar with the worker movement that are like, no, that's not Catholic Worker, <laughs> but you know, Here is Peter, the title of the essay is called Firing the Boss. And in a lot of his essays, he does only use once or twice, or this one he used in two different times in the newspaper. So it's not like it was a mistake. He used it twice. Um, So here's, it's a short essay, Firing the Boss. The CIO and the AF of L help the worker fight the boss but the worker must have a boss before the CIO and the AF of L can be of any help to the worker in fighting the boss. If it is a good thing to be a boss, it is a good thing to help the worker to be his own boss. If it is a bad thing to exploit the worker, it is a good thing to help the worker exploit himself. Fire the boss and be your own boss is a good slogan for the worker. Um, I don't know. I don't know if if I I had been talking to Peter, I might have thought of a different phrase than having the worker exploit himself. (laughs) It doesn't, something sounds wrong there, but uh, but I think that the point gets across that, you know, be, it's better if someone can be their own boss. Unfortunately, I think for Peter, when it came to who epitomized this type of thought for him the most, it's someone who has, someone who's very problematic, or at least now we know to be a very problematic person. And so uh, one of probably Peter Morin's favorite author from the the 1930s was, was an artist, English artist by the name of Eric Gill. And so he was an artist who uh, did sculptures, paintings, he designed buildings. He really was one of these artistic geniuses. He even did, um, uh, what do you call it, fonts for, he created his own fonts for letters. And so if you have, you know, people look in Microsoft Office for different fonts, you'll actually see 
different gill fonts, <laughs> G-I-L-L. -L. His fonts are, I mean, he has many, many, but some of his most famous fonts are still available for free on Microsoft Office. Unfortunately, he was someone that abused his own family members, his daughters. Um, it seems like he kind of, he started these art colonies and they ended up being places where he kind of lorded from the outside, from all that Peter Morin or anyone would have known during the time period, especially far removed in the United States, it looked like these were heavenly places where the workers were getting together in colonies and supporting each other, living in community, selling their works at a living wage and or, you know, for a liv livable price. Uh, but inside, these are places where he was lording his power over and the fact that he was the face of it meant that he could you know, abuse people physically and psychologically. So it's, you know, a very tainted individual and legacy. Um, but but he was definitely the person that at the time Peter Morin in many of his essays lifts up and quotes his writings regularly. Because uh, he's a very, he wrote many books during the 20s and 30s and was very well respected at the time. Uh, yeah, so one other thing when I was thinking of this uh, discussion that came to me is, even though in one sense, I would say Dorothy and Peter disagree on at least their emphasis, and it makes Peter perhaps look a bit more unflexible in his thought and the application of his thought, uh, he definitely was a little more flexible than perhaps I've stated thus far. And uh, one of, even though he's famous for saying strikes don't strike me, he also, uh, he, he has a essay, a couple essays where he talks about the sit down strike. It seems like one of the reasons that he perhaps wasn't initially attracted to strikes or often attracted to strikes is they often were violent. And I think today when we think of strikes, at least in the United States, they are not usually violent affairs, but during the 1920s and 1930s, usually the police were called in and it erupted into violence. And pe people may have been killed or at least seriously injured. And so when there, were, uh, when there was a strike, I believe in Detroit at an auto plant, um, where the workers sat down and made it purposefully nonviolent. Peter did promote that strike in one of his essays and spoke about it kind of, I believe they may have been, I don't know enough about that strike in Detroit, but he seems to be indicating that they were influenced by the Gandhian method of what Gandhi was doing in India at the time in the early thirties. And Peter seems to, uh, he lifts up that strike as something different that he does support and Again, I don't think it's the end of you. He'd prefer that they fire the bosses, but uh, he is supportive of that as at least a way for them to um, cooperate more with the bosses in the interim. Uh, another, uh, to just give one more example of that, a, a strange figure that he often, no, he's not a strange figure, but it's just strange to see him in Peter Morin is Leon Harmel. Uh, who uh, was a French industrialist in the late 1800s. So I think in French should be properly pronounced Leon, Leon Armel, <laughs> but I'll just say it in English, Leon Armel. Um, so he was an owner, started a factory, but he made sure that the workers had adequate time off. It what really was, it was a city. <laughs> it was like its own town all built around this factory, which normally when I think of something like that, you think of when that's been done in the United States, especially in like coal areas and used as a very oppressive measure where the workers might be paid on like using company money <laughs> and then they have to buy everything back from the company. But it appears that Leon Harmel, he made sure workers had adequate time off. He brought in teachers that the children had very good schooling. They had good living conditions. Um, they weren't going to be trapped in this cycle where they had to stay there because they were always in debt. They were being paid a living wage. And he, he was a very um, 
a very faithful Catholic who would take his workers that wanted to, they would go on pilgrimages together to Rome. <laughs> and it seemed like these pilgrimages uh, where they would actually have meetings at that time with Pope Leo XIII were actually influential. Those, the pilgrimages and then Leo meeting him and these workers seemed to play a role in Leo XIII writing Rerum Novarum, kind of what's viewed as the very first Catholic social encyclical on, uh, on the conditions of labor at that time. And a lot of what's lifted up is what should be the situation between owners and laborers is epitomized in Leon Harmel. Again, I don't think Peter wants that to be the end game, but I think it is one of those times where we see Peter essentially saying, if we are stuck in this situation for the time being while we're trying to get out of it, this is the way that owners should respond to the situation. They should make sure that workers have adequate time off, medical care, have adequate housing, adequate education. They should be making sure that with their excess wealth, the workers are really taken care of and they're living dignified lives. So what do you think this all means for the Catholic worker today? Like what, it's, Peter always has these grand visions of things, but, but what does that mean for us now, either people who are within the movement or people who are interested in Dorothy Day or interested in the Catholic worker in general? Where do we go from here? Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's where the rubber <laughs> hits the road. I mean, obviously there's still, we don't, it's not the same factory situation, but we still have workers who are working for huge employers, whether they're Walmart or Amazon. And, and what, you know, maybe they're just, they're maybe not putting on the same screw <laughs> in the attaching the same light bulb in the car as it goes to the assembly line. But if they're at Walmart, they're perhaps just stocking the toy area over and over and over again. Or if they're, you know, maybe even worse at a place like Amazon, where if they're working in the warehouse, just the, the work where their whole attention needs to be focused on just putting boxes where they need to go and getting them off the shelf as fast as possible. And uh, it's definitely, neither of those are visions of creative work. And at the same time there, the workers aren't being paid enough. Um, though I know with the shortage of workers, maybe even this was a little bit before COVID, but especially afterwards, I know you have examples of places like Walmart that are, Walmart and maybe Target, and I'm sure Amazon's probably part of it too, where I'd hear advertisements on the radio for, especially for Target and Walmart, where they'll help pay for college tuition, <laughs> which I, I think is, you know, probably something where they could just pay everyone a living wage, but if you throw out college tuition where there's only gonna be so many people that actually take advantage of it. So I'm sure it works out fine for some people in their particular situations, but for others, it's something that they can't or doesn't make sense for them to take advantage of anyways. And we see people that are just living from paycheck to paycheck. So, and, and the thirties was also a time where I don't know what, percentage of workers in the United States were in unions, but obviously a much, I mean, I think from the 30s to like the 50s, maybe going up to the 70s, you know, that's a very good, you know, relatively good time in the United States for the labor movement. And then it really starts receding. And so, you know, another difference today where it is just that most of these workers are not in unions. And so there is no even organizing arm for Peter to not, <laughs> to Peter to say, well, you need to be, you need to have a boss before the AFL can support you anyways. Well, now you can have a boss and it, for the largest employer in the United States and it doesn't matter, the AFL can't help you out. Um, so, I mean, it, I think when it comes to the big ideas, his thought is still rather applicable. Um, but, you know, yeah, what is the role of the Catholic worker movement? Because I think even in the 30s, the Catholic worker movement struggled in how we 
put this into practice. And, you know, Dorothy, it's, there's the famous example of where they provided some housing and a soup line and everything's for these, uh, uh, I think, port workers that were, um, that were on strike. And it's, it seemed like she was trying to get more substantially involved to some degree in the labor movement. But I think that largely came to an end with World War II with so many labor, with so many union jobs now being used to support the making of weapons. And so I think that's where we kind of see a divorce. Uh, I mean, I don't think the labor movement would ever say it was married to the Catholic worker movement. It was more of a one-way relationship that ended with World War II but yeah, how are we supportive of workers and advocating for creative work is something that I think we, the Catholic worker movement struggled with since the 1930s. And I don't, that's a long way to say, I don't have a good answer <laughs> for how, how we should also continue to, you know, or start to be a voice with what, how labor, should be today. You know, one piece of Peter's thought that I don't think um, we've touched on here or in our other conversations we've had about labor is just uh, the relationship to of scholar and worker. Um, do you want to just say a little bit of, about how he understands that or how those things should interact? Yeah, so Peter, I mean, I think it's uh, in our society, there has naturally been this, I don't know, I shouldn't say that. There is not unnaturally <laughs> been this division that goes back hundreds, if not thousands of years, depending on what part of Western society where, you know, those with money and means can go to college and become educated, can become scholars of sorts and those without the money and means become the laborers. And Peter definitely wanted to bring down the, the wall between those two. And I think that was partially the role of, or what he was hoping the role of something like the round table discussions would be that you'd be bringing scholars, not just as you often have, as I know from going to academic conferences, it's just academics talking to other academics roundtable discussions are you have at least the early ones he's often bringing academics to have a conversation with regular people and i think as that continued you'd also realize well there are you know quote unquote regular people among us who are also experts in certain things that could also lead roundtable discussions on topics and 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 they might have you know and there's a a better than average chance that they have knowledge of something that a scholar doesn't have knowledge and especially because you know scholarship or college education usually has you hone in on one very specific area and that was one of peter's main critiques of academia is that as he liked to say they know more and more about less and less uh, with that was his critique of academic specialization and so the roundtable discussions were his way of bringing workers and scholars together. So as he said, the workers could be scholars and the scholars could be workers. But I think it was also a way that with bringing people in from all walks of life to kind of get these discussions on different topics started, uh, that we could all become generalists. <laughs> he, he really wanted an emphasis on like, what good is it to know more and more about this small little pocket of what you do if you can't see how it fits in the big picture of creating a more functional society? And so I think that was the other part where ideally with the workers and scholars coming together, you have practical, real life, everyday experience being brought together with theories of the day to test them out, to see if they're really legitimate. And then hopefully this can bring us forward in um, creating a, a better world where we have the input of not just the scholar. I think there's this um, from, the, from the right in the United States, 
there's often this viewpoint of scholars, they're the elite intellectuals. And, you know, to, to some, depending on the topic or the area, especially maybe if they're in business, they are leading how our society is formed in other areas, not so much. So I'd, I don't think Peter viewed it that way either. You know, I think there can be this demonization of education and Peter definitely isn't, he isn't anti-intellectual, but he definitely wants to broaden what it means to be intellectual and to people who have a larger vision of society. So Lincoln, how did you get all into Peter Morin to begin with? <laughs> I was thinking about that as before this call, because um, I know I often, one of my memories when I first came, at least the first couple of years I was at The Worker, I remember there was one time where there was a professor from Marquette that knew something about the Catholic Worker and brought her class to Casa Maria. And normally there was someone else who would give talks, but they must have been busy with something. And I had sat in on a bunch of his talks and I was asked. So it was probably one of my first talks. And I think she liked Peter. And I, at that point, perhaps wrote Peter off. I kind of <laughs> viewed him as a little more out there. And I wasn't as convinced by his vision of the farming communes and the back to the land movement. A lot of his ideas, I still was unconvinced of where now, I mean, there still are ideas where I think Peter's wrong, but I'm much, in his vision of society as a whole, I'm much more a believer in Peter than I was at the beginning. And I know I made some flippant remark about Peter and, and I remember she was, she seemed, the professor seemed shocked. And she's like, but Peter's ideas laid the vision for this, <laughs> laid the vision for the whole movement and for Dorothy. And I'm like, well, you're right. But, um, but I don't, you know, when did that change come for me? I'm not sure. I, if I, I'm sure a large part of it was that we did have, there was this little green booklet as some Catholic worker put it together. I don't remember who published it off hand but there was a little there's a little self kind of published green booklet that was a collection of peter's essays and i did at some point start reading that and thinking about them more and i think that was the beginning of me taking peter more seriously as i really and not just saw maybe an essay or two that was published in the new york catholic worker but kind of like sitting with more of his essays that pointed out his broader vision it started all clicking for me more. You've already shared some of his uh, great one-liners with us. Do you, do you, are there any others that are your favorite that you'd like to throw out there? Or or do you have like a favorite piece of his thought or or easy essay you, you all like to think about? Um, hmm. There is, um, I guess, I don't know if I'll say it's my favorite, favorite, but uh, I feel like I haven't talked enough about the farming communes. Granted, we were talking, because that does fit into his vision of labor. Like, you know, as he'd say, on the land, no one is unemployed. There's always something to do on the land. And so, and that, and if you're living as more of a, with a communal sense on the land, if there's more to do during certain times of the year, everyone pitches in. And if there's less to do, everyone has less to do and can, you know, enjoy the downtime. And so there's, um, there is this essay, it's one of the ones that he used more often, but I don't see, I, uh, he used this eight times in the paper. He quoted this essay called Laborers of a Farming Commune, but I don't know if I've ever seen it printed in a Catholic worker periodical. <laughs> so, you know, there's like his set of essays that are regularly published by Catholic worker groups, but this isn't one of them. But I think it, it's definitely one of his core essays. So laborers of a farming commune. Laborers of a farming commune do not work for wages. They leave that to the farming commune. Laborers of a farming commune do not look for a bank account. 
they leave that to the farming commune. Laborers of a farming commune do not look for an insurance policy. They leave that to the farming commune. Laborers of a farming commune do not look for unemployment insurance. They leave that to the farming commune. Laborers of a farming commune do not look for an old age pension. They leave that to the farming commune. Laborers of a farming commune do not look for economic security. They leave that to the farming commune. Now, in one sense, I, I would champion that essay and say there, you know, living in a community around a farm or in a village economy, you know, this is the ideal. This on paper looks so much better than city life where we're isolated <laughs> in our little boxes. Um, and if someone becomes unemployed, they're more on their own. And but there is the danger, which I think Peter omits in, um, in which I think is a legitimate critique that a back to the land movement doesn't guarantee that everyone's rights will be respected or you know, to, to use Eric Gill as the perfect example, <laughs> they, they had what on the outside looked like this perfect vision of a artist colony, but it was a place where he was lording his power over and abusing others. And, you know, a small village type, you know, a society of villages doesn't guarantee that there won't be villages because we have a lot of history of villages are small towns where women are treated poorly, where women aren't respected, where uh, where white supremacy reigns, and where it's not safe for um, for people of color to try to open their own business or uh, dispute uh, dispute uh, pay or a trade over something. And so, you know. It, Peter also was a big promoter of the Southern agrarians, which were a movement of Southern intellectuals uh, promoting a back to the land vision and anti-industrialism. But their essays that Peter quotes from, he doesn't quote these parts that I'm about to mention, but they also are just full of racist rants. <laughs> and, you know, so one of the, at least in American society, cities, for all the problems that they have, have often been a place where people have been able to flee <laughs> village or small town life, uh, whether you know because of the color of their skin, because they're a woman, because they're gay or lesbian or trans. Uh, cities can be a haven at some point to get away from oppressive communities. So that is an aspect of Peter's thought that I do think if we're gonna move forward and promote Peter's thought as Catholic workers, we always need to be keeping that in the back of our minds that Peter, that was not on Peter's radar. Uh, it was at least, at least not on the, his main radar uh, almost at all. Yeah, we need to keep doing a clarification of thought and you know, acknowledge Peter and Dorothy are not 100% right 100% of the time. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's, you know, they definitely both encourage clarification of a thought as a way to address problems or inconsistencies or blind spots uh, in their own thinking. And so I think both Peter and Dorothy are clear that their vision of society shouldn't be the end all and be all, that it's what they kind of piece together from their time and their perspectives. And clarification of thought is meant to bring in other voices other than their own. Anything else, Lincoln, that we haven't touched on that you think would be important to know? I feel I had a little list and I did cover all those things and yeah, this has been one. I feel like we really covered um, Peter's vision of labor and work at strong points and perhaps some of its misgivings that we need to be on the watch for if we're if we want to be promoters of it in a way that's 
authentic to what he wanted because he doesn't want to create a society where certain people are oppressed or where my, I mean, he is, he is cognizant of these issues, but not, he's not always think he, he's definitely aware of different minority groups. Uh, I, but I think particularly during his time, he was thinking of how certain ways that governments were organized or communities were organized were oppressive to the Jews. Like he's, he has a lot of essays where he's, wants to make sure that he's very clear and vehement that this type of way of organizing could be harmful to a minority group like the Jewish people in certain countries. And um, I think that we need to expand on that. And I think mostly as a movement we have. So we are we are a growing organism and um, it's and that's a, a wonderful thing to see. Well, thanks so much for talking with us today. Thank you, it was a pleasure. Well, thanks to Lincoln for being willing to share with us his uh, wealth of knowledge about Peter Morin uh, and some of his favorite easy essays. Uh, it is really interesting, this contrast between Peter and Dorothy, with Peter not really being all that excited about strikes or organized labor. Yeah, I've heard another Catholic worker think about it uh, as like, Dorothy is kind of looking to a, the new Jerusalem while Peter's looking back to Eden or something like that, but that they, they both have this vision that wraps around and joins each other in, in this concern for like, as Lincoln put it, to have uh, worker owners instead of, you know, just worker employees is ultimately the goal. And yeah, uh, Peter is just ready to completely abandon like the industrial system and, and says we shouldn't even be playing that game as opposed to Dorothy's uh, concern for the workers liberating themselves like in this moment. Yeah, there's sometimes this tension, I think, between this idea of uh, reformation versus revolution of how much focus do we put on fixing the very real problems that are impacting people's lives in front of us and at the same time not propping up a system that will never in the end get us to this vision that both peter and dorothy wanted to get to yeah i think part of the reason you know over the years like the farming commune craft-based society has not taken off quite as much in the Catholic worker movement or Peter hasn't like inspired the same excitement as Dorothy Day is partly because of his this take on industrialism that he has, which is just so far outside of how we do things now and maybe how we imagine things could be. Um, this idea of like creative work or something like it's just so far beyond what we think of because of like all of our experiences of having a job and industrialism has like played out pretty well for some of us in like the northern hemisphere or the first world or whatever you want to call it uh so peter is is a lot harder to grapple with i, I realize for normal folks I think there's also this piece of because Peter is so focused on the ideal, a lot of times it's hard to view as being practical. And even though we might conceptually be like, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. The jump from here to there is so great. I think that it's sort of, you know, difficult for most of us to even think about. Um, and so because of that, it's it's easy just to sort of put it on the side. Peter was not really one to lay out a roadmap of practicality of how to get from the now to this idealistic 
agrarian communal society. Yeah. I think there was an interesting moment during the COVID time, actually, that I think about sometimes when it comes to Peter Morin and this industrialism question and labor and creative work, where all of a sudden all these people were, did not have like a capitalist job anymore, right? They And it was because of a terrible pandemic. And so we don't need to... Uh, idealize that or whatever, but there was this phenomenon where stores like couldn't keep yeast in stock, like baking yeast. And sewing websites were getting like hundreds of times the traffic they had previously gotten. And seed catalogs had, were selling out of all of their seeds. And so we had this moment where people were freed from that kind of capitalist drudgery that Lincoln ta talks about or that Peter talks about. Um, and what did they choose to do? They chose to do like a creative labor. Like they chose to work, we could say. Uh, it wasn't attached to profit or anything like that. Uh, and in fact, it was like that their f lives for the first time were unattached to this capitalist system people were doing the things that we are supposedly freed from under industrial capitalism people were baking their own bread sewing their own clothes growing their own food like these are the very things that like capitalism promises us it is saving us from but here was an example completely uncoerced uh where people were choosing to do that when they were freed from soul crushing labor. I believe Lincoln referenced this briefly um, in this interview. I don't think I'm getting it mixed up with a, another one of some of the idea of like guaranteed income. Um, and that it, it's a, it's an interesting thought of if we do move to such a tech-based society and many of the jobs become automated it's like as we think about the idea of labor what does that do given the fact that so many of us i mean right now right we're using technology to record these podcasts and it would be hard for us to get rid of it or to convince the world to um and is it something that things like guaranteed income or could allow for more generative creative labor. Um, knowing that, I mean, I tend to perhaps be a little more practically focused than Peter, and I don't think we're going to reverse uh, the industrial revolution or uh, the technological advances we've had. Um, but could we, could we move people into a space where they have that freedom to actually do meaningful work rather than work that must be done simply to exist. Yeah, I think, again, that, that like kind of pandemic example is an interesting, like very like minor test point. If people weren't working it, or they could choose the work they, they could do, what would it look like? I, I still think, it, I think it would naturally lead us away from industrialism for certain things, right? Peter Morinell talks about like me that men get rich off of the machines, specifically talking about the capitalists, but that they spend all their money on handmade goods, you know? And so like one of the things industrialism like deprives us of is like furniture, let's look at an example. People used to make furniture, like craftspeople, and it was really nice. And you maybe even like hand it down to the next generation. But like now with industrialism, we have like an Ikea or a Target make it, assemble it at home bookshelf or dresser or something like that. And while there's like maybe a certain practicality of making more of those, um, 
there's also like an impracticality and like they just aren't as good. They won't last as long. It is not as pleasurable. I'm I'm sitting at the LA Catholic Worker right now looking at this desk that is probably something like an IKEA thing. It's not nice to look at or anything. It it, it is practical. Um so I, I think if we freed folks like that's Peter's dream is like a craft based society where people could be doing that. Or I I know personally a woman who is a professional pastry baker by training, but like she couldn't get a job that paid the bills uh, under our current system, right? So luckily she she's a teacher. She has like an, a meaningful job, but like how many folks like that are denied that they're on the assembly line, turning that one screw like Peter, like Lincoln talked about or stocking the same shelf. Not that those jobs don't have value, but like uh, th this friend I have would love to just be like making pastries all the time and it would be better. And instead, like she can't do that under our current system. And instead industrialism gives us Twinkies, right? That's, it's like, that's the example. So I, I think it it would naturally come about. There is like a practical industrialness to like making nails, though. Like we don't need artisanally mail, made nails necessarily to be building our house out of. Maybe a factory is good. A good use of a factory is to make nails. But I think people, if they were free to do their own stuff, would find creative pursuits and do them. What would be your creative pursuit of choice, Theo? Uh, I like growing food. I was somebody who spent a lot of time gardening during the pandemic. And often when I was working a job, I'd think, man, I wish I could be preserving some of that food. Or I wish I had more time to weed the garden and stuff like that. Uh, so I'm not entirely sure. I'll, I'll let you know after the uh, Green Revolution happens but maybe it would be growing food. Nice, nice. Do you have anything else that you wanted to, to add to this one? I was, I was a little surprised, though I was appreciative that Lincoln brought up some of these lapses in Peter, Peter's judgments or missteps or folks that Peter and Dorothy liked who are not viewed so favorably today, like Eric Gill, who Lincoln talked about. I, I think it's a good reminder that they weren't always right and they didn't always recommend the best people at times. Yeah, Dorothy and Peter were fallible, just like the rest of us, which I think is sort of... Um... In some ways, this understanding is, is sort of built into their understanding of themselves with this encouragement of the continual clarification of thought and this lack of kind of hard and fast boundaries um, or specifications, which really leaves room for people to develop their ideas and, and move forward with them. Hopefully, as a movement, we can keep that clarification of thought and and non-rigidness in front of us uh, at all times as we try and build this world where it's easier to be good well that wraps up for us another episode of coffee with Catholic workers. Uh, if you want to reach out to us with any sort of comment or suggestion, you can email us at coffeewithcatholicworkers at gmail.com. Uh, we want to thank Chris from the Bloomington Catholic Worker for help with editing, David Hayes for our music, Becky McIntyre for our graphic. Thanks for joining us again for some clarification of thought. We hope today's conversation has been enlightening and maybe even that you're encouraged to go out and help build a world where it's easier to be good. <laughs>